Hello, everyone. What's up? We're back again. I'm here with Kevin, the, uh, the editor guy. <laughs> That's me. And, um, yeah, today, yeah, let's turn on the, the little engine, making sure everything, okay, looks perfect. Um, so here, yeah, we're going to talk about the Caro Contenay. So what do you know about the Caro? Not that much. You start with C6, right? Yeah. And then I think you want to push the deep on, like, pretty much most of the time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so yeah, first of all, it's only against King Pawn. Against Queen Pawn, I'm going to teach you something else. It seems like all of your games are seeing King Pawn, though, so there's... Yeah, my level, it's like a ton of King Pawn. Yeah, we're not going to worry about Queen Pawn for a while. So D4, D5, this is the normal way that people play this, but I, I see it, you're, you've been getting a lot of games where Knight F3, D5 has happened, this type of thing. Just put your Knights on the Golden Squares, there's really not much else to add. If you play, if they play D4, Knight on the Golden Square... If they go here, you put your other knight on the golden square. This position is very easy to play. They they really should not be playing this position this way. We've been seeing a lot of people putting their knight on c3, but positionally this is actually bad. They would want their pawn to be on c4 Yeah. to fight for the d5 square, right? Given where it is now, they can never really play for c4. They would have to move their knight out of the way, push the pawn, and then move their knight back, and that would be too, too mechanically difficult. Uh, so back here, normally the best plan for them is to play c4. Do you know what this is called? Uh, I don't think so. The Panov Botvinnik attack. I definitely did not know that. Yeah, it's named after two Soviet players, one named Panov. I've heard of Botvinnik, but I've never heard of the other one. i never heard of Panov. Yeah, Panov, I'm actually not sure what his deal was. He's an interesting guy. He never got that high up in the Soviet ranks. I think he played in some Soviet championships, but he, he never came close to being the world's elite, but regardless, he has an opening named after him. Knight f6, they play knight c3. And so, yeah, you can see that they have a lot of tension here. Back in the day, I used to think that it's always good to give your opponent the Isolani. The Isolani is known as the isolated d-pawn, and so I would always take here, but this is actually quite bad. They'll take back, and they're going to have a lot of pressure here. Yeah, that's a nice bishop they have. Yeah. Um, you see that this is an isolated pawn, right? Yeah. In general, like, if if this is played, then their pawn is stuck here, and a lot of people get fixated on this and think that black is just winning here because this pawn is going to be a little weak. As the game gets closer to an ending, it becomes more and more weak. A good rule of thumb, though, is whoever has, as long as white, or as long as the side with the Isolani, um, and, uh, uh, yeah, let, sorry, let me just finish my point. As long as the side with the Isolani has more pieces attacking this, more minor pieces attacking this, than black... Or then the other side, then it's never going to be an issue for them. Yeah. And the reason why is that they'll be able to push whenever they want. So for that reason, you do not... It's I've seen a lot of players at lower levels, they learn about what the Isolani is. And uh, yeah, by the way, you can get the Isolani from both sides. It's, yeah, I understand It's it very, is. very common. Um, like for instance, in your French, it could it. there's a very common line called the Tarash, knight d2, c5, and this is extremely common for this type of position to happen. I've been in this position. Nice. Do you like the pawn or do you not like the pawn? It's not the way I, I, I'm hoping things go. Nice. Well, now you know, though. If you have more minor pieces attacking the square in front of it, you're okay. So, yeah, rounding <laughs> rounding everything out, I know I'm jumping from tangent to tangent. Um, in this position, whose move is it here? Yeah, it's Black's move here. We do not want to take. Instead, we're just going to play bishop g4. Bishop g4, we're pinning the knight. Things are about to get really, really hectic. They're going to take. We're going to take. I want to turn off... Let me just put this here so that you can't see any of the moves. They play queen b3. Now things are getting a little spicy. you got two things hanging here. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do? Knight takes knight? Uh, so knight takes knight makes sense. I'm trying to remember. I think if they play bishop c4, you're in a lot of trouble. Yeah. Because the idea is you're... They're about to threaten checkmate here, and they're going to get your knight sooner or later. Um, or also maybe even just b takes. Yeah, I think that's b takes is clearer. They're able to really help this pawn. This, uh, yeah, this pawn is not weak anymore. Right. And uh, another problem with this is look at what's going to happen. They're going to kick your knight out with d5 and then bring the bishop here. Yeah, that does create a ton of problems I didn't see. It just seemed like the natural move, but yeah, with a little thinking about it, that's not the move. Yeah. All right, so I got two pieces hanging. I got the knight and the pawn. Uh, well, think about if you can make any bigger move first. The pawn is not a piece. They don't. 
don't worry about it nearly as much as the night. Maybe bishop takes? Yeah, bishop takes first is good, because you're defending the knight. Yeah, plus so, if he takes, his structure's ruined. Yeah, exactly. So they are supposed to take here, and the idea is they still have a lot of pressure here. Mm -hmm. Then uh, a5. But knight to a5? No, knight a5 isn't going to work. Look at this. They're going to bamboozle you. They're going to check you. Do you want to give up the queen or move your knight back when then you're, you're dropping the knight? That's a terrible bamboozle. Yeah. That's brutal. You know what they call that? What? A stumble of the steed. Is that actually what they call it? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one to just make up. That one I actually believed. Yeah. Uh, okay, so let me think. Well, the past two were duds, but this time I got it. Uh, well, keep in mind, you don't, don't worry about defending this pawn so much. Just make sure to reinforce the knight. So just e, you know, e6? Yeah, exactly, e6. Okay. And then they take this pawn. You're still in some hot water here. This is known... I'm actually not going to tell you the name of the variation because that's going to give you some hints, but um, this is like... There are like 20 moves of theory in this line, and I mean, as you play this more and more, probably the first time you play this, you're just going to forget it, and you're, you, hopefully your opponent forgets it as much as you do and you get a good game. But there, there is going to be a bit of learning curve to this variation. There's no way you're going to be able to replay all of this yeah. the very first time. Um... Yeah, your knight is hanging. If you move your knight somewhere normal, what would they do? Let me move this. Uh, get their queen in there? I'm going to get the bishop in there? Yeah, you're getting mated. Yeah. This is like mating two or something. Yeah. Here, that's the end. I don't enjoy that. That's, that's not over. That. I don't want that to happen to me. Yeah, you got to be careful. So... <laughs> uh, Rook to c8? Rook c8 makes sense, uh, but alas, um, it's still not good. You're still in trouble here. And keep in mind, you're still down the pawn. You yeah. never regain the pawn. Is there any way you can regain the pawn while covering that square? I'm thinking something with b8, but then that doesn't do anything because he's covering that pawn and my knight's hanging. So, oh, just take the pawn with that knight. Yeah, and you're covering this. Yeah. And here's where things get really spicy. So the thing is... is this is a very scary position. Well, your structure is much better, though. If they don't do anything in one move, you play bishop e7, you castle, and you're close to winning. Here. Yeah. So they have to keep finding the best moves here. I would I would bet that at your level, most people are going to just misremember their line here and not go for this. They have to play bishop e5, you take. And now if they take with the queen, you just play queen d7, and you're doing very well. Taking, taking, and you have... This is... This variation is known as the endgame line, because you've got an endgame on your hands. This is a good version of it, though. We're going to see that they have a slightly better way to, to go for this. The idea is here, you're completely fine here. Because there are no queens on the board, the fact that your king is in the center, not a problem at all. You're going to play something like bishop c5, and just rook e8, and rook e2, or maybe even you could try rook c8, rook c2 first. Mm -hmm. In practice, black is often better here. Uh, the only way that they can play this is, look at this, they're going to try to bamboozle you. Queen c6. You can't block with the queen because your rook is going to drop. So you have to play king e7 first. That's very scary. Yeah. It looks horrifying. Yeah. At lower levels, it looks really horrifying. If you were playing against the Karo Khan, if you were still playing the king pawn stuff, I would have recommended playing this line as um as white because people are going to get... So many people here would just get two, two, <laughs> two tens and play queen d7 and yeah, definitely. Just, just drop the rook. So yeah, king e7, yeah, you're completely fine, though. The computer says completely level. Um, now they do have to take. Or no, they don't, actually, sorry. So they, they could take, and this is considered the normal theory. You play queen d7 here. And if they check you, you go back, and you're doing completely fine. Um, think about this position here. Notice that your structure is so much better than theirs, right? So if you can just get your king safe, that's fine. But now you can't castle anymore. So what's going to be the plan for your king? Just to add to that for a second, because queens are on the board, you do need to still think very seriously about queen sa or king safety here. Yeah, no, I get it. I'm just trying to think. Because trying to get it, you know, that way, it seems like it would just take too long. Yeah. Uh, so maybe a bishop to d6 and then put the king on e7? That's a legitimately good idea, but there's still a lot of angles that could access your king. And you're on a, a half-open file. It would be better to build a nook here. Okay. Yeah. Just always remember this. If you can't castle for some reason, f6, king, f7 is a good second best. Because the pawn protects your king really well, right? There are no knight checks. And if we look at the position, they don't really have any diagonal light-squared bishop. 
so that your king would be much safer there than it would be on e7. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah, so weirdly enough, after they check here, they're, they're not supposed to check. They're just going to take here. You're going to take back. They're going to take. You're going to take. And the only difference between this position and the one we just looked at was the king was on d7. Mm -hmm. So here this is a bit better for them than before. They, they castle and you play king e6. You get your king out. It's a bit of a mess here. I would bet that only when you hit 1500 are people going to play this far. Yeah. There's, I don't think anyone in rate of the thousand is going to remember this much. Um, it, th this is really cool though. Actually, there everyone thought that they had to take the knight, but then people realized you can also check, mm -hmm. and you're you're able to hold on to your piece. But the problem is now you have like you're up a piece, but you're like a boxer in the ring, and you have your hands like just up against yeah up over your face, and so they're they're just landing punch after punch against you right this these pieces are not well placed at all now yeah and the idea is something like castles or maybe not castles immediately first takes takes and then castles they're gonna bring their rooks here and this is still this is still a mess but no one no one at your level is playing queen c5 queen c5 is like super grandmaster theory yeah that's very scary yeah the idea is you are up a piece but more it's more or less useless right because it's just a, a punching bag for them with this gets into like, studying a black position and going to an endgame position like this, it makes me think, like, to what extent, I'm, when I'm playing black at my level, obviously, like, am I trying to get a winning position or a drawing position? Like, a, a, an okay position that I might be able to win, but it's like, you, is it more of like a draw type thing or what? Uh, if you're asking whether you should be happy with a draw at your level, definitely not. Yeah. Um, even if you get a dead drawn position, you should still play for a win. Yeah, I, I get that, but like this position seems like much more likely to end up in an even position than like let's say when we we're learning the bird, where it's like yeah more ways to win. Is that normal for learning a black opening? I think that that's more true at higher levels. At lower levels, there's still such an enormous margin for error that yeah, even even like rook and pawns against rook and pawns, yeah, one definitely. side could easily throw it away. Um, yeah, I mean that is true that there is a bit the margin for error is a bit smaller than before in terms of what you would need to do to make a win, but it's. I don't know. I think, the, and also, as long as there's an imbalance in the position, right? Like, even here, if we go back to this, um, like, if they take, if we go to this position, there is still an imbalance here, right? You have a much healthier pawn structure, but they have better development. They're yeah. going to bring their rooks in, but they do have weaknesses here. So the idea is that as long as there's an imbalance, you should be able to play for a win. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, and that goes for both, right? They have more development than you, so... They could try to go for an attack on your king. It's not going to go for... It's not going to turn into a mating attack, but the idea is, you know, if you dawdle around, if they check you, you're supposed to, I think, go go to f6 or f5. I actually need to... Yeah, wait, let me let me turn on the computer to see what... Yeah, you're supposed to play king e6, they check, and then king f5. And your king just sits here naturally. But the idea is that they would try to bring their rooks in super quickly, right? They could bring their rooks in here to attack this, or they could come in here to attack this. Um, or sorry, let me just turn this back off. So, yeah, in this position, as long as you have something that your opponent doesn't have, you should always be able to, to play for a win in some way. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. This line is super tricky. I would, I'm interested in actually when the first time you're going to see this is, because it, it's not going to be for a very long time. Uh, there is one other way that they can play this here. Normally, by the way, this position is not reached with knight f3, move one, it's d4, d5, takes, takes. C4, and then we, yeah, this is the famous Panov Balfinic attack. We see it written here. Knight f6, they play knight c3, we play knight c6. So they could play knight f3, and then we play bishop g4, and that goes into what we looked at. The only other normal move here is bishop g5. Mm -hmm. And yeah, bishop g5, what are they doing? They're threatening to take and win this. So what do you think we would do here? Uh,. You're probably going to say this is wrong, but because it's slow. But my instinct is immediately get the free push back on the knight and open up the not open up, but get a free escape thing for the king on h. So like h h six. Well, the problem with h six is they're going to take. Yeah. And then takes and takes, and this is going to be a really painful check. Okay. Uh, right, your knight gets kicked off of the golden square. Okay. So let me look at the position again. If they had to go back, by the way, then that would be completely legitimate. Yeah. Does uh, bishop to g4 do anything? No, bishop g4 would not be good, especially here they're going to play queen b3. 
Okay, maybe not queen b3. Sorry, I don't know. As you can see, the bar went up. I'm not sure exactly. Queen a4, is that the move? Yeah, okay, queen a4. The One of the tricks here is that they might really lay siege to this diagonal, and that's why you do not want to develop this bishop too soon in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. Back when the knight was on f3, that was a more annoying pin for them, and so that was, that was what justified it, but here, there's nothing to justify this move. So keep in mind, though, what's the difference here? Their knight has not come here, meaning this pawn is weaker than before. Uh, pawn takes? Yeah, exactly. Um, now things get really, really messy. The idea here is that if bishop takes, I think here you... N oh, I cannot remember this for the life of me. Either we take here immediately or we play h6, but sooner or later we need to play h6. Um, the idea... Yeah, we play h6 first. If they take, we can take back this way. Um, and the, the really big difference here is that back in the, that other position, they were going to take here, and our knight did not have e5, mm -hmm. right, with the pawn. Now if they push d5, though, your knight has a healthy square here. That makes sense. That makes an enormous difference. If your knight gets kicked from a golden square but can move into the center comfortably, it's completely different from, from otherwise. Yeah, you're going to play bishop d6 in castle. You're better here, believe it or not. Your bishops are very good. They, do, they more or less have an extra pawn in any endgame, but the difference is that your bishops are going to be so much better. And we're going to see this structure later on. This might look a little familiar to things that you've already seen. Um, did you look at chapter one at all? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so this this looks very similar, right? The idea is that when their knight gets to f3, even though it's normally on a golden square, it's completely defanged because it cannot go to either of these squares. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's rock solid. So normally they have to play bishop h4. Computer saying we could play a6. Normally, though... I'm trying to remember how it works. Normally we take, yeah, this is all really not, this is all really messy theory. Takes, 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 they castle, we play e5. We're defending our knight. Notice though they're enormously ahead in development. Mm -hmm. But the queens are off the board, meaning that we're not going to get mated. We might just be a bit worse. Then they play f4. And I still can't remember, there's some reason why this pawn had to be here. At some point we're going to play g5. The difference is that back with this pawn on h7, if we tried to kick their bishop, they would be able to take immediately. So, yeah, we played bishop g4. I cannot I cannot remember the rest, but yeah, knight f3. I'm just reading from the computer. I can't remember the rest of the theory here. I think bishop g4, if I turn on the engine, or if I turn on the database. Yeah, there's just some enormous difference here. You'll, you'll have to take me at my word for this, but like knight f3, we take... And uh, I think even bishop d6 here might be okay. We'll get back to you on what the difference here is, but there, there is some really significant reason why we had to play h6 here. Like, if we go back and we just go down this line, we're going to see it now, because this bishop has not moved. There's some big difference. I cannot remember it. Oh, God, this is going to drive me nuts. All right, I, I can't tell you what the difference is. I remember, though, that there are a lot more tricks here after castles. I mean, if you go back to... I mean, the, obviously, I don't know, but the main difference seemed to be when it was here, it wasn't defended by this pawn, but in the version you just did, it was defended by that pawn, so maybe it's... No, it's still vulnerable, though. Yeah, I, I'm just trying to think what the hypothetical difference could possibly be. Yeah. Yeah, this is, uh, this is Grandmaster Chess. This is really, really... Yeah, obviously, I'm not going to know, but it just seems like that's, like, one obvious sort of... Yeah. Structural difference. No, I didn't mean to say it even that way. I just meant, like, just, um... Like, there's there's some really deep meaning for the theory of why... I remember in my Carol Kahn book... It, in the Carol Kahn book, it would explain it in this position. There is some significant difference. I guess here, though, it doesn't matter. Maybe, the, like, there's some positions where they could play knight b5. Like, if we play... Okay, yeah, if we play h6 here, then they take. This is a problem. Yeah. You see the difference? Like, back here, if they're... If their bishop had gone to h4, then of course we would just have the position we wanted anyway. And if we take here, yeah, this is what I was thinking of. Your knight is hanging, if your knight moves, then knight b5, and that's going to hurt. I don't like that. <laughs> no siree. Um, okay, so going back, so d takes. Yeah, if they take with the bishop, you just play h6, and then you, you take with the queen, and that's all fine. They could also play d5, and here you're just going to go to e5. Your knight gets in. As long as they kick you from the golden square, but your knight has a square in the center, it should be fine. Now they have, uh... Yeah, if they ever take here, you get the same type of position like before. Your bishop is going to go here. Notice that your bishop is really fantastic. The, they do not have a dark squared bishop. Your bishop could go either to this square or to this square. Both of these diagonals are going to be superb. 
I know that this is like a well thought out line, so there's like specific reasons. But is there a fundamental? Because from my understanding, the fundamental is I want to capture towards the center with my pawns. So is this just an exception case, or is there some fundamental like rule of when you're supposed to take away from? Uh, no, this is just because you're developing. Yeah, so this is just a specific... You're developing and your king is going to be super safe over there. Yeah. The, the position is going to be very dynamic, especially because there's an imbalance now. When they take here, they're trading bishop for knight, meaning you're going to have an extra bishop. You're going to have an extra long-range piece. There's going to be a, a very dynamic battle going on. Makes right? sense. So that would, that, would, that would more encourage just keeping your king safe and... Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm sure... I would bet that even after G takes, you're okay. But it's... There's just, your king is going to have to stay in the center. There is, there's a famous IM, his name is Yakov, and he likes playing this setup with the G takes, but it's, it's really hard to manage this. It, it is still playable. Um, like, going back, he really likes, um, he likes doing this. Takes, takes, knight f6, he takes with G here, and it gets really wacky. It does look crazy. It's not that bad, though, as you can see. It's, it's a bit worse. My main problem here is, like, we want to play e6, but then our bishop just gets stuck. Yeah. It's very ugly. So, meanwhile, though, if your bishop comes out and you play e6, they just play knight f3, h4, and they're going to chop it. So, I, I really hated these positions. Um, but, yeah, technically they are playable. Um, yeah, I was thinking a lot about it, by the way. the um, Just in general, you should be very afraid of doubled pawns, but as long as the doubled pawns are part of a triangle, and so what I mean by triangle is something like this... Mm -hmm. then it's fine hmm. if it's if it's anything else if it's like this like i don't even even what that would be yeah what type of shape is that if it's three and then one no it's just like this it's like uh, assume like an isosceles triangle yeah or pretty a much triangle yeah um yeah like imagine this pawn was up here right so yeah. it would be like this that's not that good because then the f5 pawn is a bit vulnerable yeah. but this this is very safe almost all of them are protecting each other in some way the last move you should look at is queen d4. Queen d4 attacks your knight, and there's some problems here. If you play knight g6, they take here, and they have a very healthy pawn mm -hmm. at, this, at this moment. Um, here we have to play a very interesting move here. We can meet their attack on our knight with a counterattack against their bishop. It's wacky. If they take, which way are we going to take? Yeah, definitely. E takes. Our bishop gets out. Everything is good. Um, yeah, the, the, I had... I had a game, this was like 15 years ago, which went, my opponent took and I took here. This is very comfortable. You're going to play g6 and bishop g7 and your bishop is just going to be a monster. Yeah. There's nothing, they have no pawns to put in the way anymore. So it's it's just going to dominate the whole board sooner or later. Um, Alright, so that, this is the Panov. This is like one of, I think they're like four, yeah, they're, they're like four really popular systems against the Karakhan, so this was one of them. The second is this, c3. Both of these involve the exchange. These, there are two main systems involving the exchange. Uh, c3 is very simple. Put your knights on the golden squares. Um, make sure to get your bishop out before pushing this pawn. That's really critical. If they play bishop b5, I think we talked about this yesterday, then play bishop d7. Yeah. But normally they're going to play bishop d3. You bring your bishop out now. And if they go here now, they've wasted a move, so whatever they're doing shouldn't even be a problem. Um, they're going to castle. We play e6. They play h3. You're happy to take. You could do both. Um, I'm sure both are fine here. If we look at the computer, this this is relatively equal. Bishop h5 is also equal. I guess the computer slightly prefers this. Uh, and, like, yeah, let's just say bishop f4 happens. You can just trade. There's really no problem here. Takes, takes. Queen e2. Castles. So I want you to think about a plan here. You're going to get the structure extremely often. This is what you want to aim for. You want to have this healthy structure here with f7, e6, d5. Your bishop is outside of the pawn chain. Notice that if your bishop was back over here, this could get very uncomfortable. With your bishop over here, they would play knight e5. Your bishop wouldn't be pinning, so they would be free to immediately go knight e5. They would play f4. They would lift their rook in. They would, have, they would start to have some attack against your king. Mm hmm your bishop is fundamentally better here, not only for impeding knight e5, but also you can always oppose their bishop. Yeah. If you need to. But, so, yeah, I'm trying to think of what the route to attack would be. Because they don't seem like they have any major weaknesses. Yeah. Well, wh yeah, where should you be playing, first of all? Uh, the king side? No, right. They You have an extra pawn on the king side, meaning you have less of a window. And... Okay. 
I didn't know you that understand was a rule. That, I mean, that, that's a, that makes sense, but I, didn't, I wasn't. I didn't know that was a rule. You understand? Like they, they, their access to the king side is so much bigger than yours. You only have a tiny little window in. Okay, so, so attack you, the queen side. That makes sense. Yeah, right. Because you're you're missing a pawn over there, so actually you have much better access. Yeah, it's counterintuitive. No, it makes sense. How would you attack the queen side? Uh. My initial thought is knight a5 to c4, but then I don't see what that gets me. Yeah. That's nothing. So maybe rook to c? Uh, you have some ideas, but keep in mind their structure is very healthy here. You need to create a weakness. Start pushing? Yeah. You want to go for what's called a minority attack, which in any other situation is a very sensitive term. Yeah. <laughs> but in this case, it's... um. Yeah, this is just a popular chess term. The idea is you have a pawn minority here, right? You have two against three. Mm. And so you want to get this pawn up. Yeah. Once this pawn comes up, they, they're going to have a very uncomfortable decision. If they take, then they have weaknesses here and here. Yeah. If they let you take, then you trade and they have a weakness here and here. Yeah. There's pretty much no way for them to avoid some type of weakness here. It, it does take a while for you to prepare it, but you should just prepare it. I think especially at your level, people are just not going to even know what to do. So you're going to play a6, b5, and b4. Yeah. It's this a very like simple a, plan. Because we've talked about uh, breakthroughs and the adult improvement videos. But yeah. But it's definitely like a tough skill to master, but clearly like a very important one of like, cause I get so often like locked into like positions like this. And I just am thinking like, how do I conserve material and look for like obvious weaknesses, but they often don't exist. Yeah. So I have to like master like when it's time to break through. I mean, you're talking about a skill. I think you're talking, if you're just talking about getting a, getting a new structure and figuring out where to break through, that's nearly impossible. It's just from having experience. Yeah, so I'm, that's what I'm saying. That's, like, I think a clear difference between having experience and not having experience because that's, like, it, 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 it seems to me from, like, speaking to you and seeing games that it's, like, so important, but it's much, like, more difficult than knowing, like, the basic fundamental rules that are easy to explain. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, the idea is that, like, as you play this position more and more, this is just going to be obvious. It's not... It's not, I think even at Grandmaster level, if if we if they were able to, like, give us a structure that we'd never seen before, then it would be difficult for us as well. Yeah. It's, yeah, it all just depends on the position. But the idea is as you start to know it, as you just get experience in it, it's something that's going to be confusing to someone, to any of your opponents that haven't really played this. It's going to be just, like, second nature to you. Yeah. Another break you can go for is E5, but that's a bit dubious because you're going to get a weak... Isolani there. And keep in mind, now they have much better control over that square, right? They can always put their knight here. Mm -hmm. So, e5, you can go for in some situations. Um, just, I have a very interesting positional question for you. Let me flip the script for a second. Let's play, let's say we're playing white here. White plays rook e1 and black plays b5. What should white do in this position? Uh... Well, it's either A or B pawn that you do something, I assume, but I'm just trying to think it through. Mm. Yeah, I guess just A3. Um, so A3 makes a lot of sense. I think actually that would be best. Um, let me, yeah, let me slightly change the position. Let's say that they played rook B8 and let's say white had wasted their time. Let's say it was something like this. Or no, let me just put the king here. I'm just trying to waste some moves. Oh, I guess we could still take here, but assume you couldn't take. Okay. Yeah, assume, let me, I'm just going to keep on manipulating the position around. Let's say this queen is here. Okay. Uh, so what I'm scared of is him just pushing. So then that would be b3, b4. Yeah, exactly. And the idea is the knight is coming in. Yeah. This is actually a very weak square now that the pawn has been pushed. Notice that back here, white can't really go for it. If white goes for this now, it will just get kicked. But yeah. Th the idea is, though, white is waiting it out. If white plays b4 anytime soon, like if black plays this and white plays b4, then he's just created a huge weakness here. Because yeah. he cannot shield the, the file. You see that? Because the knight can always be unplugged eventually with b6. But the idea is white is playing the, the waiting game. White is just waiting around, and then when b5 happens, b4 could be very strong, because then the knight can immediately clog everything. Um, and notice also with b4, now the knight does not have a way in immediately. Nice. This is, of course, a weak square, but it's going to take a lot of time. Um, 
Uh, yeah, I think, I think maybe as you get like up to like seventeen, eighteen hundred, then these uh, these like plans rivaling each other are going to start to matter. At the, where you are right now, just the fact that you understand the plans of the structure that's going to be what matters. Mm -hmm. um, you also you do have to keep in mind that all of these like strategic ideas and all these strategic goals are completely superseded by all the tactical issues. Yeah. Like you can't you can't keep botching rooks. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, okay, yeah, so that's pretty much it. I mean, the only thing is, you just need to make sure that you get your bishop outside of the structure. There, um, like, some people play bishop d3, knight f6, and then, I don't think you're gonna play anyone below 2200 who plays this, but h3. You see the idea? They're stopping your bishop from getting out. Mm -hmm. And most people will just, will just sort of bail out and play e6, but then this is considered a strategic, um, concession here. Your bishop is never gonna get out. So, in this position... From what I remember, uh, you could just play g6, and then your bishop will get out this way. And it looks like a weird structure, but this is actually fine for you. You're going to play e6 and have a nice Christmas tree. Nice. Yeah. You can also, now because you have this this enormous converge over the square, the knight is going to be very well placed there. Yeah. Yeah, in general, you shouldn't really worry too much about taking on f5 or f6 with a g-pawn, because it's still part of a, a really cohesive unit here. Mm-hmm. In general, e takes is better when it's when it's possible, but on f5, of course, the, the e pawn couldn't take. I know, like the last time I asked about the general through line, and it, it didn't have a, you didn't seem to think that that's like the correct way of thinking about it. But like just for the Karl Khan, it's like why would I play it? And I guess the gen, the best advantage of it is that you're trading. Like, what's the advantage of playing the Karl Khan? I guess is the question. Like, what is it? What is it good at? And helping me understand that, I think, helps me understand sort of the positions. Because, like, I'm not going to get these exact positions off, and especially in my level. Yeah. So, like, what's my big advantage after, like, the first it, it, first few moves? Well, the idea is that when it, when you're playing against King Pawn, you have two options. You can play for full for equal space in the center with e5 or c5. Yeah. Or you could play for a more restrained solid variation, like c6 or e6. Now, e6 gets to very closed positions. The idea is that all of these are just a bit harder for you to play because your bishop is blocked. Yeah. That doesn't mean that objectively it's that bad. The computer is going to rate them as more or less the same. But it's just harder to play. And also there's less of an imbalance. If they take here, this is one of the most boring positions ever. Yeah. And it's just very hard to get excited about this position. You're literally just playing like the copycat down a move. Now, yeah. It's, it's relatively... It is relatively easy to play, but even so, if we compare that to the other position, the other position has more imbalances. So this is a way to play solid, but with a lot of imbalance. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, because like the position we just did with the exchange French, it's I have played that hundreds of times, I guess, and it is very boring. Yeah, I can't stand it. I stopped playing the uh, I stopped playing the French. I was trying to play the French a lot while I was going for my GM title, and it was so annoying because you know I'll be paired against someone who's like three hundred points lower. They'll know I'm playing the French, and they'll just prepare 20 moves in this. Yeah. And, okay, I might have some chances, but it's just, it's so boring. Yeah. This, uh, people who play the exchange French, not a friend of the show. Except for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you play the, the exchange? Uh, I was until I figured, I, 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 I don't have a deep Shame repertoire. on you. <laughs> that was the only one I knew. Oh, that's terrible. Um, okay, anyway, so D4, D5. Uh, so there are two other systems here apart from taking. I guess try not to look at this because that's going to tell you some of them. No, just <laughs> just don't look there. What do you think? What are the two other moves? Uh, the push. Yeah, pushing is the advanced variation. And then uh, perhaps maybe... No, I wouldn't want to push the F-pawn. No. Yeah, I'm trying to think. That's called the fantasy variation. Yeah. Enough. It's not. It's not that bad. We're not going to go over it. People at your level are not going to be playing it. It's. Uh, we're going over like the four main systems, the four families. So this. There's this and this. There's also this and this. There's this and there's one more. Does it involve a pawn or a, a piece? A piece. Uh, knight to c six. Knight c three. Yeah. Knight C3, exactly. C three. Yeah. Knight on the golden square. Um, yeah, so knight c3 is the main move. They can play... So we'll go over we'll go over knight c3 last. e5 is the advanced variation. These positions are very interesting. We're going to play bishop f5. This is one of... This is considered one of the practical huge advantages over the French. If we looked at the French, your pawn would be on e6 instead, and you would not be able to get your bishop out. Mm -hmm. It's a lot more tricky here. 
Um, the idea is that you don't want to play c5 anytime soon. If you play c5 anytime soon, this bishop check is going to really hurt. But later, much later in the game, you'll be able to play c5, and that's going to be like a supercharged version of the French, because mm -hmm. your bishop is on the outside. Um, yeah, so like they, they have a, a lot of moves here. They could play bishop d3. This is just equal. Bishop d3, you, just, you happily take, you play e6. And... Um, I mean, yeah, you're just... I think you're going to have to, like, review this video for homework at some point. Um, you Notice your knights do not have access to either of the golden squares here. You could play c5 and knight c6, I think, but it's a little dubious. A better way to do it is put this knight on d7, put this knight on e7, then play c5, and bring this knight to the golden square. Do you see that? Okay. It takes a while, but the idea is they can't really do anything here. This structure is just fine for you. Why is the... King pawn, the king knight, better than the than just waiting and putting the queen knight there. Um, well, because it, yeah, it's it's tricky, but the idea is you need to support this pawn with something. They're gonna play something like bishop e three, and if you play this to play knight c six, they're just gonna snatch it. Yeah, it's it, these positions are very very tricky. Like the idea is if you play knight d seven here, knight f three, knight e seven. You have a lot of ways to play this, by the way. You don't need to do this and put the, the king's knight there. You could also just bring the king's knight out this way. Yeah, that's I, I my knight ends up there very often in the French, and it's a, like often a pretty comfortable position for it. It's good. Yeah, I mean, if your knight your knight doesn't have this square, but this turns into the golden square yeah. in this position. Yeah, that that would be completely fine. You can also play c five here. The idea of c five is takes, then you play knight c six. They they want a pawn for the moment, but now look you. Like, think about the difference here. You have two knights attacking this pawn now. Mm -hmm. If we liken it, if you're, if it was your queen's knight, then your king's knight would have been here, and you wouldn't have enough pressure on this. Mm -hmm. But here, you're attacking both of these too much. Yeah, this is one way to play it. You can also play knight f5. I think you'll you'll get a good sense of things. Like, for instance, if they're obviously just playing tooth and nail to stop your c5 push, for instance, if they do something like b4, then of course you can't play c5, but then just readjust, put your knight on f5. The idea is that even though you have a lot less space here, you've traded off a pair of pieces, right? When you have less space, that normally translates into your pieces not having enough squares. But with every set of pieces you trade, that ratio of good squares to pieces improves in your favor dramatically. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, so this this is fine. I think we'll, we'll, we'll end this yeah. exact line here. You could even go for this now because they've pushed this too far. Yeah. Um... Yeah, the, no one... Actually, a lot of people might play bishop d3, but it's not considered a good variation. Um, they have a ton of things they could do here. There are probably like 10 different systems here, if you believe it. They could do this. And now things get a little trickier. You do not want to play e6 here. Normally, this is the, the way to, to do it, but they're going to play g4. And whoopsie-daisy, your bishop is trapped. Mm -hmm. You have to first fight against them. Um, h6 is technically okay, but h6 leads to insane positions here. There's stuff like g4, bishop d7, h5, e6, f4, and like just look at this space here. I don't want to play this. Yeah, no, it's it's very uncomfortable. There there are a lot of cool variations here, by the way. I played this in a, a park, a chess park in Bosnia, with like the that set of huge pieces, like yeah. um, I remember where you like said... you you pick them up. Yeah, I think I sent you that video. Um, but yeah, like and you just you. White can literally put their king on g3 and they're fine because there's no angles to ever get at them. And then white can still advance because, just look at this, they have all the access to this zone here. Yeah, I'm, I'm never, if I ever see them push h4, uh, I'm not, never playing h6. This looks brutal. You're running home? Yeah, I resign. <laughs> I don't so want to. play h, uh, h4, I'm, I'm done. Yeah. But you could you just play h5, I guess, is the correct move? Yeah. Um, I actually forgot, look at that, this is the tall variation. This is named after that famous guy. Yeah. What a nut. <laughs> yeah, that, that one looked terrible. <laughs> he just, he's going for it. He's going for it straight out of the gate. Um, okay, so h5, and then they play bishop d3. And the idea is this is an improved version of that other position. Why? Because now they've gotten you to weaken the g5 square. Their bishop can sit here forever. Yeah. Before they would, you would be able to play h6. You don't really want to play f6. That's going to weaken these squares too much. So you're just going to have to live with the fact that their bishop is getting to g5. A good way to play this is just play e6, knight f3. There's a, by the way, there is a lot more theory here, but I'll leave it with this. A good idea here is to just transfer our queen over to this diagonal. That way we'll be able to sl be slicing through. We're threatening a queen trade. And uh, we'd also be stopping them from castling. Mm -hmm. So how could we get our queen to this square as quickly as possible? Uh, check and then... Yeah, exactly. So check, they play something like this, and we go here, and this is completely fine. If they trade, this is just equal. 
You could play c5 eventually. There's literally no rush here, though. This is a very nice strategic position here. Your knight has a lot of good squares here. You could go here. You could also push c5 and play knight c6. Whenever you play c5, they can take and they can get this decent square for their knight. So you could play c5. There definitely wouldn't be any problem with that. If you want to be very sneaky, though, you could play b6 and then c5, and then you could take back with the pawn. Mm -hmm. That would also be fine. Both of these are good. They're, these. This is just a very healthy position. If they're trying to play for a win, they need to be able to play c4 against your queen a6. So the, the best move here is knight d2, and if queen a6, c4. And things keep going crazy here. I, I don't think anyone you're playing against is going to know this far. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is pretty wacky. Um, what is... there's the Yeah, there, there's so many variations here named after various players. They could play knight c3. This is the Shira variation. e6, and then they play g4. Yeah, what is... Okay, I guess they don't put the name here, but it, this is called the Shiro variation. It's named after another famous player. Bishop g6, and then they play knight e2, and they're going to f4. I can't remember what to do here. I'm going to just look at the computer. Yeah, we play c5. The idea with their knight here is their knight is coming here, and they're going to attack our bishop. So then they want to play h4. We play h5 to stop them. They play knight f4. Um, and yeah, weirdly enough, I think we just... We play bishop h7 and give away the pawn. And the idea is they take here, and then we play knight c6, and we're just we're fighting on the center. They they spent like ten moves just winning this rook pawn. Yeah. So ultimately, you're doing quite well here. I had a game in Denmark like 15 years ago where I I, I won a nice position like this. This is it's it's much more comfortable for you to play. It's very easy for them to go wrong here. Like if they make a normal move somewhere, all of a sudden the computer can really heavily dip in your favor. It's it's really hard for them to manage these positions. Um, and there are a lot of cool options. Like if they take here, you can just take back, and they're not supposed to take here. Getting this free pawn with a check is is pretty bad, apparently. Your queen is going to come here and just deal enormous damage. Also, like keep in mind, right? This knight is not on the golden square here, so your knight can just hop in to the party. Nice. Okay, I guess not. I guess there's <laughs> there's something. Don't wrong do here. that. <laughs> um, but okay, you can you can hop into this party. Okay, I guess not. <laughs> um, all right, so this. That's a crazy variation, though. I think almost no one plays this. Um, yeah. It's definitely not, like, a natural line. Yeah. They could also play knight f3. We play e6. And then they play bishop e2. Do you know who this is named after? No. It's someone who's a friend of the show. Uh, friend of the show. World champion candidate. Played against Kasparov. Never accepts my rematches. Oh, it's, uh... <laughs> I, I know who it I is. I played him, like, three times. He never he never accepts the rematch. I know who it is, but I forget the name right <laughs> now. Nigel Short. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, friend of the show. Friend of the show. <laughs> accept the rematches, man. Yeah. He needs to accept the rematches. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is just a fine position. Um, this is completely normal. Uh, I think they play... Or, sorry, here... Yeah, Bishop E2. What is the move here? Yeah, it's c5. Let me just check the, the table base. I haven't looked at this theory in ages. Okay, yeah, this is... If there are, if there are this many games, this is obviously like a legitimate line. Um, yeah, c5. Things just get really crazy here. I don't think anything is a concern. Like, bishop e3, this is normal. You take, they take. And this could actually become a problem. Look at this. They're, they're going to take here and ruin your structure. So you need to remember this. You're going to play knight e7. This is a very, very classic idea in these positions. Um, you're just gonna you want to put your knight on c6, but you want to be able to retake with your knight So you play knight e7 and then knight c6 Nice, and you're just delaying the development of your bishop your bishop does want to come out Your knight is not gonna stay on the square forever your knight is gonna either you're gonna move your bishop out of the way and Put your knight here or this knight is gonna trade itself and then your knight is just gonna come over there. Yeah That's cool. Yeah, these are strange positions. This is only if your opponents are really putting you to the test though I don't think most people are gonna play this like, I would have bet that most people will get up to, like, something like this and then start winging it. Yeah, probably, but it's good to look at the positions anyway. I mean, if we have to, like, look at positions just to learn, might as well look at ones that people, someone's actually playing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'm trying to think of any others. Uh, there's this one. There's so many variations here. There's The, the idea is their knight goes to b3. So e6, knight b3, and they're stopping you from playing c5 now. You're going to play knight d7? How does the theory go here? They play knight f3, you play knight e7, they play bishop e2. What do you think is the move here? Uh, 
I'm shaking my head because I don't even know how I'm going to explain this. This is one of like the weirdest examples of chess, mo- chess opening theory. A6. No, there's no need for A6. I mean, A6 actually makes sense because we want to play C5 and not worry about Bishop B5, but... um. Like, the idea here is uh, they're not really threatening us just yet, but they want to play bishop e3. And they're, they're just going to clamp down on this. Their idea is that if they, they have avoided trading pieces, so we still do face a bit of a cramp. Notice that if these bishops were off the board, our knight could just glide out very easily. So there's a bit of a cramp here, and they want to just contain any c5 business. Um, yeah. So generally, we're going to abandon c5, right, as a plan? Yeah, c5 is just not going to work in time here because they placed their entire setup around it. So how would we reroute? Maybe... I have no clue. The move is nice c8. Not in a million years would I have gotten that. I don't, I don't understand. I, I can't... I understand it. I could never explain it, though. The idea is that our knight might be coming here in some positions. Notice that because their knight is here, they cannot play b3. It was a waste of time to ask me. <laughs> I was not getting that. Yeah. Wait, I'm trying to... I think... There, I don't know why the computer's writing this so badly for black. From what I remember, this is the line that's recommended in that chess book. And that chess book is computer tested. I think, like, they play bishop e3. No, sorry, they could play a4. a4 is a very common move here. And the idea of a4 is that if we play knight b6, they're going to play a5, and our knight is actually sort of stuck here. They could play, they could just trade it off. And long term, they've gotten still a really tight grip. I. I actually, I still don't really understand this position, but I think the idea is that we play a6. Yeah, we play a6, and um, now we can play for... I honestly, I just don't understand this position that well. I'm just trying to recount this to you because the theory is just so insane. They play a5 here. What do we do? <laughs> Resign. You play knight a7. This is Your so knight is going to be fine. <laughs> yeah, this is the brutal. <laughs> I am trying to, like, I remember when I was studying this. I was studying this in Serbia when I was really trying to play the Karol Khan. This was right after I, I played Anna yeah, yeah, yeah. in that match. And, uh... How common is the Karol Khan? It's very common. Yeah. The, the Karol is extremely common. I think after E4, I would assume it's more popular than the French, but less popular than E5 and C5. Yeah. That's, so it's up there for sure. Yeah, it's like the third most. Like, speaks the third most Italian. Yeah. Yeah. No, this this is really wacky stuff, though. The idea of your knight being on b5, though, is that if they ever play c4, you take, and then your knight reroutes this way. So you only spent, like, ten moves. <laughs> I will never play this. That's never so say never. Yeah. I know, I might be put up against this, but the chances of me being in this situation and then remembering that I have to move my king pawn, my, my king knight to ultimately d4, d5, is not going to happen. Yeah. You're saying you wouldn't find this intuitive to go from e7 to c8 to a7? <laughs> yeah, imagine you're on e7 and you say your knight has to get to d5. How do you do it? And the answer is c8, a7. Yeah, no way. There is actually like a nice moral of the story, though. Notice your knight was really misplaced here because it was blocking the bishop. Yeah. Your knight is harmonious now. No, it's, I get it's it. Ugly, but it's it doesn't harmonious. look bad now, but it, it's... Again, I, it looks pretty bad, but it's going to go to b5 where it's relatively safe. Yeah, no, I get it. I get I get the whole thing when you explain it, but it, the chance of me seeing this in the <laughs> game is like zero. We'll see. Maybe if you like, <laughs> locked me in a room for a few years, then I would start seeing moves like that. We'll see. You never know. Yeah. That was the whole reason I kept on looking at variations in this position. I wanted to find this one where your knight goes to a7. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Um, okay, so let's get to the final move now. Knight c3... Here we take, they take, we play knight f6, they take, we take. This is all standard stuff. They really can't do anything else here. What do you think we would do if they play bishop d3? Uh, bishop f5? No, that would lose a piece, sir. They'll take with check and then... Oh, the check. I always forget the Oh, check. well, actually, wait, no, sorry. You're not losing a piece here. Takes, takes, takes. Why is it still okay for you? Uh, one moment. Ah. Think about a way to hit. Oh, check and then take. Yeah, exactly. Good. Um, yeah. So better though here is just taking. We can just get snacking. That's this scary is, though. This is another nice thing, right? If the pawn was on e6 instead, you would just lose your queen yeah. to the check. But here they have nothing. 
Uh, you gotta be a bit careful, but this should be fine. If they play knight f3, you can sit your queen here. No knight on the golden square here, so you're fine. Um, yeah, so they're gonna take, though. I don't think they have any other options. They could also try something like knight c5. Um, but then you can use the fact that the, your bishop is attacking this knight and play e5. Yeah. And this looks very strong. You're just already really putting pressure on this pawn to, to identify what it's gonna do. Um, they could also play knight g3, but then you can just start harassing it. Start chasing after it. Um, okay, so they take, you take here. And I really don't think there's that much to discuss here. Um, if they play knight f3, pretty much no matter what, you're just gonna put your bishop on d6 and castle. Makes sense. And the idea is you have a really, really healthy setup here. Like, knight f3, bishop d6, bishop d3, castles, bishop e3. The idea is that likely your bishop is going to go to g4, so here, for instance, it's fine. Long term, your knight just needs to aim at e6. Your knight wants to get to one of these three squares. e6, though, is the most likely. The other two are also good, but, like, d5 can be hit by c4, and there's a chance of g6 just being too, too misplaced after something like g3. G3. So E6 is the best square. So our knight would go either from A6 to C7 to E6 or from D7 to F8 to E6. This is a good... It seems like a good opening to practice wacky knight moves. Yeah. Yeah, it, lo it definitely looks strange. The idea, though, is that because these because of your, your structure, your knight is going to have to find another sort of golden square. And in this case, the knight on E6 is very good. No, I'm not being sarcastic. It is a good skill, and this does seem to... There's multiple variations that force you to do it. Yeah. No, but by the way, though, I could tell that, like, of course this is going to be surprising to you the first time, but this is just the nature of whenever you're playing a structure that's new to you, just acclimatizing yourself to this entire repertoire of new ideas is always going to be a bit foreign. Yeah. It's going to be a bit strange. No, it's exciting. It's, after playing the French exclusively, everything's very exciting. Yeah. Yeah, the French is so boring. Um, yeah, and also, like, if they, if they push your bishop back, you could take, but it's often better to just get the cube. You remember the cube. The cube is better than undoubling. Yeah. Why would you... You don't want the... Who wants a diamond when they can have the cube? Yeah, I guess you're, you still have doubles anyway. But yeah, then what, you have a single you, double versus a double double. What are you more afraid of? A cube or a rhombus? <laughs> I'm terrified of cubes. You know that. <laughs> rhombus? That's like... That's something you learn in preschool. Yeah. What type of nonsense is that? Yeah. A cube. A cube could be anything. Yeah. It could be a cube of dynamite. Isn't there, like, in some spiritual, some occultism, some, like, black cube energy? Yeah, that's a thing. I don't, yeah. know, I don't know much about it. Yeah, that's not really under the purview of our chess channel, but... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, no, but I mean, I know I was just using, like, jokes about that, but actually, though, why is this so much better? Because uh, you could just... You have two pawns behind, so you can push these extremely liberally. They're not weakening a single square because you have a pawn behind them to cover mm. all the weaknesses. This does not really weaken this ever because you can always play f6. Yeah, this is a very healthy setup. A really good rule of thumb in these positions is that you can just, um... A really good rule of thumb in these positions is that you can advance these relatively liberally. And the idea is that because you have an extra pawn on this side of the board, you're not creating nearly as many uh, significant weaknesses as normally. Um, I think the last thing to discuss, I don't think a lot of people are going to play this. The main line here, though, is if they put their knight on g3. Because that in that in that sense they're not going to be dominated by this this f pawn by the golden pawn. Um, so they could play something. That, they're supposed to play c three, bishop d six, bishop d three, castles knight e two. Their knight is heading to g three. Mm -hmm. We play rook e eight. Um, by the way, I should have mentioned this already, but yeah, we have doubled pawns here. Notice in this these are these are slightly different than the positions we looked at in the panov because they didn't give us a bishop. So positionally, this was very, this was considered extremely dubious. And the first time I saw this, I was almost GM level and I still couldn't believe that it was okay. And the thing though, is that it's just, it's so uncomfortable for their pieces in the middle game. In the end game, if we took all the pieces off, their pawn ending would be winning because they would have an extra pawn here, right? Like we, we could push these pawns down the board. Likely they'll, we're not going to get a pass pawn there. If they just push this and this, they're, they have a runner Yeah, and they're going to win. Um, so as things get closer in endgame, you need to be a bit more careful. A good rule of thumb, though, is so long as you are, so long as it's not a pawn ending, so long as they're like it's kings and bishops or kings and rooks, you should still be fine. Yeah, yeah. Another thing to keep in mind. I'm just gonna tinker around with the board for a second. Like, let's say, or actually, I guess this is changing everything. But okay, we just lost all of our progress. Let me let me get back there. 
Um, but yeah, the idea is that with our knight on e6, our knight on e, our knight on e6 is so superb. Like let's say, let's say this happens, like check, bishop e3, knight d7, castles, knight f8, rook e1, bishop g4. Let's say something like this. I'm just, I'm sort of dawdling just to show you. Mm -hmm. What is the knight doing on e6? It's doing a bit of everything. It's covering this square, so you might be able to invade there. If they ever play d5 here, knight can hop here, yeah. which is good. So it's sort of serving as a, like a sort of um, a stalwart against their central expansion. They can always push, but if they do, then our knight gets some more squares. Our knight gets some nice squares. If they push, our knight is attacking this, with my, which might become vulnerable. Um... We also can even now push this, because back in the day, if we push this, the square would be weak, right? But now, when we push this, we can just keep pushing because our knight is covering the square. That's cool. Our knight is really, really superb here. Um, okay, so to get back to that position, um, they play c3, we play bishop d6, bishop d3, castles, knight e2, rook e8. Um, let me, I'm going to turn off the, the moves just so that you have to figure this out. They play queen c2 here. They're attacking this. What are we going to do here? Uh, my initial reaction is just h6. Uh, yeah, but you got to be more aggressive, h5. Okay. Yeah. h5 is really sneaky. The idea is after castles, they want to play knight g3, knight f5, and we would be in trouble there. So we're going to play h4, and they're dominated. That's cool. Yeah. And our knight is slowly going to come around here to d7, f8, e6, or d7, f8, g6. Nice. I think we've more or less covered everything. There's some other options that they can go for in these positions, but those, I don't think anyone under like 2400 on, on these websites know, knows them. No, that's definitely, uh, I learned a lot, and it seems like a, a certainly a good amount for one day. Nice.